first on the civil society, let's say, making up for the gaps where, where the government is not playing a role. In Brazil, in fact, because the very low social welfare service is available, what has really rescued, and I mean quite literally allowed for the survival of, uh, uh, in many cities especially, have been the social movements. The, uh, for example, the favelas, the, the slum uh, areas where, um, where there were already strong social movements present or NGOs or civil society organizations of different time. They very quickly, you know, shifted their activities to basically help their, their local populations. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our inaugural episode of Politics in the Era of Global Pandemic. Please enjoy the conversation, and if you want to take a deeper dive, check out our companion website for further readings. And now it is my pleasure to introduce you to Susan Spurlock, Executive Director of the Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University. Thank you very much, Rachel, and good afternoon, everyone. I join Rachel in welcoming you to this afternoon's inaugural program. Now in its 112th year, Ford Hall Forum is the oldest continuously operating free public lecture series in America. Suffolk University continues to honor the forum's storied history and legacy of providing free events that bring pressing issues and experts to the public. These are perilous times in our nation and the world, and we are shaken. The COVID-19 global pandemic systemic racism and oppression, economic health and education disparities among Black and Latinx people, the name of few of our world's myriad of maladies. This afternoon, I am delighted to welcome the Ford Hall Forum audience to our virtual classroom, a first, to explore the many themes posed by the global pandemic. Thank you, Susan. It's a pleasure to welcome everyone to what is a novel experiment for Suffolk University and the Department of Political Science and Legal Studies. We conceived of this course initially as a way to connect new students to Suffolk over the summer in very unusual times, but very unusual times have also given us the amazing opportunity to bring you, the wider public, into our classrooms. So I'd like to welcome you. As you may have already noticed, COVID-19 is not a simple phenomenon. Initially, there was a great deal of description of this pandemic as being a great equalizer, as being something that was experienced equally because everyone was equally success susceptible to infection. And very quickly, we learned that that was not the case. So from the lens of political science, we devised a survey course that is looking at some of the most important aspects of how COVID-19 is impacting different countries, different communities, and different groups and areas of the country in very different ways, whether it's race, age, ethnicity, or impact and response of governments. So for each of the next nine weeks, we ask you to join us to examine some particular facet of how COVID-19 is disrupting our world. So it is my pleasure now to begin our kickoff series by introducing Professor Sebastian Royo, who is a professor in the Department of Political, Study, of Political Science and uh, Legal Studies, and who is also our Vice President of International Affairs at Suffolk University. Sebastian? Um, the COVID-19 pandemic is probably the greatest crisis of our life. It sounds like a cliche, but it's worth saying it. We don't know how it will end. We do not know when it will end. And we know that it is still too early to predict how we will radically change our societies and our country. The impact of the pandemic has been felt all over the world. I was just checking this morning, the latest count is 474,000 deaths and 9.1 million cases confirmed as we speak. And the pandemic has also had, as Christina explained, profound social and economic consequences across the world. And it has also laid bare the structural problems in our countries, and in particular, the deep inequities and institutionalized racism 
that is still persist in our country. But countries have responded in different ways to this crisis. And these responses have resulted in different outcomes. Some countries took actions early and acted decisively, and they have been more successful arresting the pandemic, while others have taken a more laid back approach with different outcomes and consequences. As Christina said, there are many different dimensions to this crisis. And the focus on our discussion today is gonna to be on two very important dimensions, the role of institutions and the issue of legitimacy. Leaders and institutions have been absolutely critical and instrumental in the responses to the crisis, and they have largely determined the outcomes to the crisis. And these outcomes, in turn, they have impact the legitimacy and the trust in our government and institution. So today we're gonna to be focusing on the institutional dimension of the crisis and an impact on legitimacy. And we will determine how those factors will help us move forward. And to discuss these issues, we're very fortunate to have with us two very prominent scholars who are both joining us from Europe. We have Professor Maruk Doctor from the University of Hull and Professor Vivian Smith from Boston University. Our first speaker is going to be Professor Doctor, who is um, joining us from the UK. Uh, Maruk, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, uh, and a delight to be here this evening. Uh, although my comments uh, will focus on Brazil's experience with COVID-19, hopefully they will provoke reflection about other cases, including the United States. Brazil is currently at the epicenter of the pandemic. It is the second largest number of confirmed cases, over 1.1 million, and it has the second highest number of deaths, over 51,000. And only the United States has more uh, numbers in both sides. Brazil's population is only 2.7% of world population, but it has had over 10% of the deaths. In other words, the pandemic had, has hit Brazil brutally. The president of Brazil, President Jair Bolsonaro, often referred to as the tropical Trump, has been dismissive of the disease, saying, and I quote him, death is in everyone's destiny. So keeping that in mind, when I was preparing for this talk, I thought about why are political scientists uh, interested in studying a global pandemic? And I basically thought of three reasons. The first is we're interested in how institutions and leaders shape policy responses to a crisis. Secondly, we are interested in the pandemic's impacts on daily life, whether on the economy, uh, on, in, on society more generally, and of course on political outcomes, elections, democracy, and so on. And thirdly, we are interested in comparing responses and outcomes internationally to understand what worked, where, and why. So in my talk, I'll just talk in two parts, first a bit on the responses to the pandemic in Brazil, and then some of the impacts of the pandemic in Brazil. Just to clarify the words institution, uh, institution uh, in political science normally we refer to as being the formal rules as well as the informal conventions that shape political behavior and policy decisions. And when I'm talking about the role of leadership, I'm really thinking about how uh, the leader's ideology and his leadership style influences policy making, political decision making. So keeping those things in mind, how have institutions and leadership shaped the responses to the pandemic in Brazil? One of the most relevant institutions in this context is, has been federalism. This is uh, an institution that is familiar to uh, certainly all the Americans in the audience. Brazil also has a federal system with a constitutional division of powers between, and responsibilities between the states and federal governments. Uh, health policy is normally dealt with at the state level. So when the first case of the COVID-19 emerged in Brazil in late February, state governors were very quick to announce lockdowns and social distancing measures. However, a couple of weeks later, Jair Bolsonaro, the president, began to vocally contradict these measures, even joining street protests against them. So for example, he declared 
hairdressers and gyms were essential services. Uh, and so the governors were not able to shut them down. Many governors were soon at loggerheads with the president and uh, uh, he was really making their do jobs doubly difficult. The governor of Sao Paulo, the largest state in Brazil, even at, in, in an interview once said, Brazil was facing two viruses, COVID-19 and Jair Bolsonaro. Uh, more than one governor pointed out that whereas the economy uh, would recover, lost lives were lost forever, but this fell on deaf ears. So when on the 6th of June, Jair Bolsonaro ordered the COVID case numbers and the death toll data to be removed from the health ministry website, uh, the state health secretaries responded defiantly and they immediately said, well, in that case, they would collate the data and individually put it on, on their state websites. Uh, very shortly thereafter, the Supreme Court also jumped into the fray and ordered uh, the ministry to put the data back on its website, citing the constitution, uh, freedom of information legislation, as well as the need for transparency in a situation of crisis. Now this mixed messaging and very divisive politics caused much confusion in the population, not to mention a loss of trust in the government. And this had, had dire consequences for the path of COVID-19 in Brazil. Meanwhile, Bolsonaro uh, liked presenting himself as a strong man, full of vitality. He's leaping onto police horses in the middle of street protests and so on. And, this in, and he also makes very clear that in no way would he be willingly led or even guided by science. Let me next say a little bit about the impacts of the pandemic. I'll say something on the economy, on, on social issues, as well as politics. First, the economy. Jair Bolsonaro has always prioritized the economy over health policy, partly due to neoliberal thinking of his economic steam, partly due to the reality of very high levels of poverty and keeping jobs going was utterly essential in Brazil, but mainly because the rising unemployment and recession would likely jeopardize his re-election in 2022. Early economic impacts were in fact brutal. Uh, the stock market crashed. Uh, it became half its value in a couple of weeks. Factories were working under 50% of their capacity. Foreign investors were pulling their money out of Brazil. A quarter of all families were left without any income. The government was quick to take measures to support business and jobs, including some extra uh, federal government spending uh, worth some $62 billion. So that's a lot in terms of uh, the Brazilian economy's size. It set up an emergency aid fund for the poorest families. Uh, and this is vital in a country with high levels of poverty and in which income inequalities are massive. For example, one uh, calculation is that the six richest men in Brazil have as much wealth as the 105 million poorest, the half, the other 50, the poorest half of the population. So Bolsonaro, by insisting the economy stay open and ignoring social distancing measures, in a way has jeopardized the health of Brazilians and has probably worsened the country's longer term economic output. After all, a healthy economy needs healthy workers. In terms of uh, social issues, I especially want to highlight the situation of the indigenous peoples of the Amazon. Uh, COVID-19 has exposed the super vulnerability of indigenous peoples of the Amazonian rainforest. They are facing existential threats, not just from the disease, but from encroachment on their territories. This includes legal and illegal activities of loggers, ranchers, poachers, miners, gold prospectors, so on. But also from the government's very careless approach to environmental regulation and so-called development policies. Some fear the scene is being set for a genocide. In recent weeks, some 40 European multinational corporations and uh, just on Monday, 29 global investment company, uh, funds that manage over $3.7 trillion, so they're really big uh, boys, if you like, when they work together, 
have alerted the Brazilian government to their concerns about the environment as well as human rights issues, specifically uh, raising uh, problems with deforestation and the treatment of uh, indigenous people in the Amazon. The government's response has been negligent, uh, even irresponsible. For example, it deployed army personnel to stop the forest fires, which is a good thing, uh, but they failed to ensure that soldiers didn't carry COVID-19 into the Amazon, uh, infecting the, uh, uh, the indigenous population. Uh, quarantine protocols, for example, were often neglected. Indigenous communities have suffered. The state of Amazonia, which is the biggest uh, uh, Amazonian state, has the highest death rate in Brazil, 45 per 100,000 uh, inhabitants. But this just to compare it with Sao Paulo, which is also badly affected by the disease, where only 12 out of 100,000 die. Uh, once uh, the indigenous people catch the disease, they are twice as likely to die from it than other Brazilians. So finally, a quick word on the political system. During the pandemic, political tensions and growing polarization have led to confrontations. This has of course happened elsewhere in the world too, but I think it's specifically marked in Brazil, probably in the US too. The president has been engaged in a war of words uh, uh, with governors, but also with the Supreme Court judges. In fact, just yesterday, one of the Supreme Court judges uh, uh, warned uh, Bolsonaro that he would be fined if he would be, uh, were not uh, show up in public without wearing a mask. Uh, so this can also happen. His supporters have held loud anti-democracy demonstrations. They have used uh, uh, white supremacist symbols in these demonstrations. They've even called for a military coup in favor of Bolsonaro, himself an ex-military man. Many analysts fear Jair Bolsonaro's populist rhetoric and authoritarian proclivities will lead to a constitutional crisis. Some even fear a breakdown of democracy. The human and economic devastation unfolding in Brazil exposes the fragility of new democracies, especially democracies in highly unequal societies. I think I'll stop there. How do you think um, the government that you were referring to in, in Latin America, particularly in, in, um, in Brazil, how do you feel um, people are responding to the actions of the government? Do you think that this is something that is reinforcing government trust, or this is something that is eroding the support on you mentioned democracy, but government in particular? I think there is a genuinely a growing disappointment, if, if you like, in Brazil. So, of course, just a little over a year and a half ago, uh, well, in October 2018, to be precise, uh, Jair Bolsonaro won a, a very resounding victory. Huge numbers of people voted for him, uh, abandoning, uh, in fact, uh, parties they had voted for previously. Uh, so he came in with a lot of legitimacy, but once co and had but had various problems, of course, and these are a whole set of institutional issues that uh, go on in Brazil. But he had legitimacy. But his handling of COVID has become very polemical. Uh, uh, the early action of the uh, governors, as I mentioned actually contained the pandemic. The first six weeks of the pandemic, Brazil you know, had very, very, very low uh, incidence of the disease. Uh, transmission was also very low. Yes, testing was low too. So of course we never caught as many as did have it. But once Bolsonaro starts sort of stirring trouble, if you like, in the pot, uh, uh, and the messaging goes haywire, people frankly don't know how to respond. Some of them are his supporters, come what may, and so go out on the street and say, you know, what are these governors doing in, in inhibiting our economic activities? Uh, meanwhile, uh, others uh, are saying this is a pandemic, you know, it's an infectious disease. We don't have good uh, enough uh, health facilities. We don't have other things that give uh, um, authorities the ability to, uh, to govern, if you like, uh, the governing activities that uh, Vivian was talking about, uh, their populations. 
So I think we've come to an impasse. Half the population agrees with what he's doing, perhaps. In fact, less than half at this point. Uh, he is declining in the polls. Um, and the other half is desperate. One, one issue that has been perplexing to me, looking at what has been happening across the world, not just in, in Latin America, but also in the United States and in Europe, has been the breakdown of our social compact. I have been very surprised, frankly, to see how quickly we were willing to let the elderly people go, how to let young people get sick and to see what happened, and how quickly we have been willing to abandon part of our society, particularly um, the minorities, the most vulnerable citizens. So the social compact seems to be broken. Um, I think this is a very serious problem as we think about how we move forward from this um, crisis. So how do we restore it? How do we restore this social compact? Um, so very quickly in terms of the social compact, I think in countries where there are high levels of inequality, the compact was broken well before the pandemic. What the pandemic did do, it exacerbated it, it showed it up. And whether this is about the Black Lives Matter movement in the midst of a pandemic, uh, or whether it is about the desperate situation of the indigenous peoples in the Amazon, or various other minority ethnic groups in different countries around the world, um, inequality and lack of equity is, I think, at the heart of the fact of social compacts uh, breaking apart. It was not the pandemic, it's okay. structural problems within. Thank you very much, Maruk. Um, now, part of the objective of this program is also to engage the audience. So we do have some polls for the audience that we would like to, uh, to put on the screen. Um, and the question that we have is in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, what do you think should be the priority of political leaders? And um, Maruk, this is an important question. And, and some governments have prioritized the economy, other governments have focused more on health and social well-being. Um, why is this important? Well, obviously, um, both economic growth and social well-being are very important. Uh, they, are, they mutually reinforce each other, if you like, uh, in normal times uh, and over time. Governments and citizens strive for a balance between economic growth, economic well-being, if you like, from the point of view of the citizen and social well-being. But when forced to make a choice, even if it seems an artificial choice, then different people and leaders might prioritize different things uh, and at even different things at different times. Obviously, there's no correct answer to this question. What is more important here really is to consider uh, what are we as political scientists trying to discover from asking a question like that? Because one way of asking questions about economic growth and social well-being would be simply to ask an analytical question. For example, what was prioritized and why was it prior prioritized? Mm -hmm. But a normative focus, as in this case, in other words, should be prioritized and why should it be prioritized can be much more interesting precisely because it tells us something about our social values it tells us about the drivers of our political choices our actions that's why i thought it was an interesting question so here we have the results of the poll so we see about 30 percent of the respondents they felt that economic growth is more of a priority and about 90, I'm mean, sorry, 10% and 90% think that it's the social well-being. Are you surprised by these results? Let me say, I'm not surprised about the fact that social well-being came off better, but I'm astonished at the overwhelming, absolutely not to be questioned answer, 90% social well-being. What are our politicians thinking? What, why can't they hear us? I mean, and people, you know, here we have young people who know this answer in a normative way uh, asked question. As I say, it's different when you're looking at it analytically. That's hopefully good news for the future. Thank you very much. <laughs> very good news. So now um, we have our second speaker, Professor Vivian Smith from Boston University. Vivian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. And Mark, thank you also for a wonderful uh, account of uh, Brazil 
And so I'm going to be talking about, um, actually, I'm going to step back for a minute and define legitimacy. And then I'm going to give you another set of comparative examples comparing the Euro US and Europe. So what is legitimacy? And, and why need legitimacy? And, and essentially, legitimacy in a crisis is a precious resource. It's easy to lo lose, and it's hard to get back. But there are actually two ways of thinking about legitimacy, and they're interlinked. The first, at a very basic level, involves public trust in a governing authority, such that citizens consent, consent to government action, even if a decision goes against their wishes and interests. That's a very basic way to think about it. The other way is about governing activities, and that involves citizens' appreciation of a governing authorities, activities. So that's about efficacy, competent, fair, and efficient, accountability. You know, are leaders accountable? Is it to experts, to legislators, to the citizens generally? And what about transparency? Do we have access to all the information necessary? And finally, inclusiveness and openness. Uh, are governments consulting with citizens? Are they acting in a fair manner? Is it balanced? Okay, so that's just sort of an introduction. Now what I want to do is take us to legitimacy in a time of COVID. And of course, the COVID crisis has been a severe test for legitimacy of all governing authorities. You know, it's about trust in government. Um, and it's also about the governing act, and clearly it's governing activities. And so the what I'm going to be doing now is comparing, comparing the US, its federal government and state governments with Europe, the European Union, which is a regional association, essentially a regional union of member states, so the EU, the European Union, and its member states. So in a way, you've got kind of two quasi-federal systems. So if we begin with trust in government, governing authority, and what we see, the question would be, does it go up? Is it down? And of course, this depends on citizens' assessment also of the governing activities. In the US, we've seen President Trump's poll numbers go down. Um, whereas in many cases in states, the governor's polls responses have gone up. In the European Union, what you saw initially when very little was done in the very first moments, um, it went down. But then again, as you saw effective responses, it went up again. European member states, Germany, Chancellor Merkel went up to a very high level, like 80% approval ratings. Uh, President Macron went up, um, but still ends up being very low. So you have to ask, is this about legitimacy in the COVID crisis, or is just this about the French? not being happy with Macron. Sweden was very high at first, but then went down. In the UK, the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson went up by 20 points, but he got COVID-19. So was this a sympathy vote or was this about his performance? Actually, what we see is it's gone down again, so it suggests performance. But you can see I've already started talking about activities governing activities and not simply public trust. You can't separate the two. So what about first in terms of the, economic, of the governing activities, the legitimacy of the pre procedures? And here, efficacy is the first one we think about. What about the lockdown? Was there a lockdown? Yes or no? How fast did it go? Well, what about the rules for the lockdown? Were they very severe or pretty loose? Do you wear a mask? Don't you wear a mask? Um, what we can see is the US had a problem because its lockdown actually came late. It was two months beyond China um, and the US opened early. So what we see though is different states took at different action or didn't take action. So the US, you know, how do we, how do we judge efficacy? You know, federal government maybe not so good different states, some much better, others less, less good. Um, in Europe, 
the European Union had little response at first, as I've met, just mentioned, but there was tremendous difference amongst member states. Italy was too slow, but then again, who knew that the crisis, that the COVID was spreading? Um, and there were differences between regions, though, in terms of how quickly they then responded, Lombardy versus Veneto. Spain was also too slow, but it was second hit. Germany came very fast, but of course it, see, it had seen what had happened in Italy. Spain, all, France also came quickly. But in addition, to, in, in, addition in terms of efficacy, efficacy, again, what about the availability of medical equipment? Ventilators, PPE, masks, testing, if you're ill, if you're not ill. Here again, the US slow at response. Um, but again, there's massive, as you all know, probably conflict, massive conflict between the federal government and the states. And the states desperately trying to source um, masks and equipment, and the federal government saying, no, we, we, we need it. Um, very complicated. But there were, also, there were also really problems in Europe. Germany was fine. He had it all. It, it had a lot um, of equipment available. France didn't. Italy was a disaster. And then of course, you switch to the economic support, which is tremendously important. Did people get their checks? And here you see that uh, again, differences between within the US and also within Europe. So that's all about efficacy. What about accountability? Are leaders accountable? We saw that Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil did not appear to be. Um, for the most part, I think only President Trump claimed that he was not accountable. For the most part, certainly throughout Europe and American, you know, governors of American states all basically stepped up to the plate and said, no, we're responsible. Um, how do countries use their emergency powers? Do they do it to check abuses, to be efficient, or to push a different agenda? What we saw in uh, Hungary and Poland was abuse of emergency powers. They thought, oh, this is a great way to stop abortions by calling them elective. You actually also saw this in some US states. But again, still with accountability. Accountable to whom? Do you ask the experts? Um, what about legislatures? Who's, who's maintaining oversight? And I think these are also tremendously important. In the US, what you saw is we had a mix. Um, we had, saw experts speaking on a regular basis, but we also saw President Trump claiming his own expertise on chloroquine and Lysol injections. What's that? Transparency is yet another important uh, aspect. It's about truth telling. Sure that information is available. Statistics on testing, on equipment availability, on the numbers of dead. But even here, you see big difference differences in terms of, of reporting. Uh, so again, transparency important, but how do we ensure it? Uh, who do you count? Is it dead? Are the dead at home counted? Uh, if they're not tested, do you count them? Belgium has the highest number of dead, generally speaking, worldwide, but it claims that's because it counted everyone and no one else does. Inclusiveness and openness are other categories. That has to do with how much consulting on the measures, but it also involves things like tracking devices on cell phones. Are they voluntary or do you have to have them? What about privacy issues? Here we can think about China, Singapore, and South Korea with very well developed tracking apps, but very low privacy versus Europe and the US where we basically don't have much in the way of tracking apps, at least as yet. So next, uh, legitimacy in terms of policy effectiveness and performance. And here we heard about Brazil, but this is, this is the same for, for the US and Europe. Um, what are the outcomes? In particular, a number of contagions and deaths. And of course, 
When looking at the numbers, we also need to ask about demographics, age of population over 70, and especially 85 plus, but also morbidity of the population, race versus race and ethnicity, poor versus rich. It's clear poor people, people of color, have much, indigenous peoples have had, have been affected much, much more. Um, so less effective policy everywhere. Um, then the question becomes um, problems of old age homes, and this was all countries. And of course, if you have a much, much more elderly population as in Italy, that also possibly explains the numbers. But if you look at the numbers and you look at the ratio of deaths per million, the US extremely high at 375 deaths per million and rising. That's the number today versus Europe, which um, is maybe 232 deaths per million. Uh, but within that Belgium, 850 per million. That's an extremely high level. The UK, 646 per million. Spain, 606. Italy, very high as well, 574. But what's really surprising is Sweden with 570 per 507 per million, as opposed to Denmark, its neighbor, at 104 and Norway 46. And here it takes us back to procedures. Sweden decided not to shut down its economy. And it said, we all trust one another, we trust in government, so no face masks, everyone goes out. And we've seen the results. So again, you can talk about trade-offs between procedures and performance. And so finally, what about the question of political legitimacy? What about responsiveness of governments to citizens' concerns at the same time that they need to be responsible for the management of the crisis? Um, here, generally speaking, there was little consultation with citizens, but one also needs to ask questions about mainstream parties in power. What do they say? What do they do? Do we see a gain or loss in confidence in the pandemic? And you see both things. What about populist anti-system parties in power? Did they exploit the crisis for its own goals? We've already mentioned uh, Hungary, also Poland. Um, but what's interesting is populists in power, Jair Bolsonaro, disaster. Um, but in Hungary, Orban doesn't seem to have had not nearly the negative effects in terms of governing authority, loss in trust. Populist challengers in opposition, how successful? If we look at Italy and Salvini, actually he's barely heard. And in Germany, the AFD, the alternative for Germany, um, has actually lost influence. It's down to 8%, having been much, much higher, more like 17%. So what you can see is, and I'll finish, I'll finish here, is very different, different responses to the crisis. And so one looks, needs to look very closely at each country in order to get a sense of, and in, in order to decide about legitimacy, and you have to ask about not just governing authority, do people retain trust in government, but why do they do it? It's about the governing activities. How you know, how accountable, how efficacious, how transparent, but also ultimately what performance and how do they manage the politics? Thanks. Thank you very much, Vivian, um, for, for a very comprehensive overview of how different countries have responded to the crisis and the impact that it has had on trust and legitimacy in those governments. So as I mentioned before, part of our goal is to engage the audience and we have another poll question for our audience. The question that we have is uh, which government activities better ensure the legitimacy of government authority in the midst of the COVID crisis? And you have two options. I mean, this is an important question, Vivian. Um, some governments have side on the, um, on, on the direction of relying on experts and science, whereas others have taken other considerations in their decision. Why is this question important? So it's important in a way it asks, it's, it's just as um, 
um, as Professor Marouk mentioned, it's about normative questions. And here, this is really, what do citizens prefer? Um, government in each case uh, makes the decision. This is a sort of a governing authority deciding, okay, how, do we, how can we be most efficacious? But very, very different responses. Do you prefer the economy or do you prefer human life? And I think what we've seen in many cases, probably in most, um, with a few exceptions, is that governments have repeatedly decided that they declare an emergency, they impose a, mat, a lockdown in order to ensure that there are fewer dead. And yes, the economy suffers. Um, and what we've also seen, which I haven't talked about, is that most governments, having been preoccupied by debt, by all about the economics and how you can't spend, 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 uh, shifted that completely. All of a sudden, and this is really important, in particular in Europe, uh, where they were, where, where after the Eurozone crisis, so a decade ago, all governments were told, keep your debts low, keep your deficits low. As, a, as the moment the crisis hit, government saw, said, this is not about keeping the economy going. This is not about worrying, sorry. This is about keeping the economy going and spending as much as we have to. And so you've seen everyone going much, much faster in terms of spending um, much, much more deeply um, in debt, but who cares? All of a sudden, European Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, everyone steps in, and Congress in the U.S., and, um, you, and, and legislatures and governments in Europe throughout all decided we got to spend to save the economy, but first by saving lives, then we can go about figuring out how to save the economy. Thank you, Vivian. So here we have the results of the poll. We see that 90% of the respondents, they think that the government should consult with experts and only 2% that the government should not declare an emergency or impose a lockdown. Are you surprised by these responses? And no, especially after the response to um, uh, Marouk's uh, poll, I could tell that we had a whole group of people, but I think that, that, that essentially think that it's about saving lives. And ultimately, with the exception of Bolsonaro and a few others, um, it's about saving lives. And you do whatever, whatever you can, whatever it takes to save lives. And then figure out way, way far down the road how you deal with the extra debt involved. And it's important to note that it's saving lives also then meant putting a lot of money into the economy to save jobs, to whether it's unemployment insurance in the US or in Europe, in work insurance, in work money to ensure that jobs are saved, that businesses are protected. Thank you, Vivian, and thank you to the audience for their responses to the poll. I think it's got, it gives us great hope on, in the future. But now it's time to turn our attention to the students and to the audience. And it's my pleasure to introduce Arjun Singh. She's a, he's a producer for the radio show, Boston Public Radio and WGBH. So Arjun, running away with it. Thank you very much, Sebastian. As Sebastian said, my name is Arjun Singh. I'm a producer over at WGBH here in Boston. I produce the show Boston Public Radio. And thank you very much for allowing me to participate in the forum. We just heard two phenomenal speakers just now. And now what we'd like to do is we'd like to turn it over to the students who are part of this course. We have four students joining us. We'd like to turn it off. So why don't we start off with speaking with Madison Magaloon. She's a junior studying international relations and philosophy at Suffolk University, and she's joining us now. Madison, welcome. Hey, Arjun, uh, thank you. Um, so my question is, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in the use of military and authoritarian tactics in some countries, such as Brazil and Hungary, where poverty and unemployment are already a problem. Could the pandemic ultimately put some countries at risk of democratic backsliding? 
If so, in what countries are you most concerned about democratic backsliding and why? Backsliding, democratic backsliding is certainly a big concern and a growing concern in Brazil. Uh, the government, of course, uh, has um, uh, is run, if you like, by an ex-military man. He has nine ministers in his cabinet who are army generals, some of them, in fact, uh, active serving generals. Uh, he has over 3,000 military person, uh, people from the military, some of them retired, some still serving in uh, second echelon jobs. So we have a, a, a huge number of military pers personnel in Brazil. And this could have worked well uh, if the president hadn't constantly been uh, uh, getting into confrontations with the other two uh, powers, the legislature and the judiciary. He started off uh, uh, in the pandemic times understanding that the only way he's going to make some progress on the economy is to work together with uh, uh, opposition, but actually independents, not oppositions in, in Congress. He is awarding them uh, political posts to keep them happy, uh, which he said he wouldn't do in his election campaign. Meanwhile, on the streets, we have protests uh, uh, that are anti-democracy. They sort of conflate the anti-democracy with being pro-economy uh, uh, or anti-lockdown or whatever. And uh, ironically, they claim that that's limiting their freedoms. Uh, so uh, how you're anti-democracy and think uh, having your freedoms curtailed is a problem, I'm not sure. Uh, so this confrontation at the institutional level combined with the confrontations on the street is not very promising, I would say. Having said that, Brazil has reasonably strong institutions. It has excellent uh, people across many levels of government. So you certainly need to also have uh, some perspective and some hope that things will work out. Uh, Brazil is still a young democracy. Uh, its constitution dates from 1988, but we still uh, uh, think there is enough room to resist. So I'll just jump in and um, talk about Hungary and issues for Europe. And it's actually um, lots of Central and Eastern European countries uh, are experiencing a shift to what is often called illiberal democracy, which is a misnomer, but it's, 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 it's countries where they're trying to diminish all of the institutions of liberal democracy. Uh, rule of law in terms of substituting judge, independent judges for political friends, um, reducing the freedom of the press, um, and, and all sorts of other things. And what we see in Hungary, and this is, this is the issue in some countries like Poland, there's still a relatively strong opposition. But in Hungary, um, Orban won a two thirds majority and was able to change the constitution. And once that happens, very hard to turn back. Um, what we saw, what, what did happen though, is that the European Union objected, but it objected very late. And here, that's a real problem with the European Union not having the power or not having strong power to do anything, in part because of the way it's set up. There is no European government as such. There is what they call governance, but it's uh, the 27 member states all have a veto. So Hungary or its friend Poland could veto any attempt to sanction the other. Um, now this is, they're now moving farther in terms of sanctions, but unfortunately um, this is all, it, it has gone way too far. And so my concern is that Hungary um, is down, is on the road to authoritarianism. There's no question about that. Um, how far it goes really depends upon the extent to which the EU is able to act, to start sanctioning, to stop money flowing to Hungary. And the same thing can be said about Poland as these countries reduce um, civil liberties. 
and uh, independence of the judiciary. Now we'll go to Diana Gesslum. She's a rising junior at Suffolk as well, majoring in environmental policy and international relations. Diana, welcome. Hi, thank you. So my question would be to Professor Marouk, uh, seeing how President Bolsonaro has handled the pandemic from undermining the state government, the steps of state government to launching a campaign on stopping social distancing, do you think that the Brazilian political system and civil society can help counterbalance his downplay of scientific evidence towards that of COVID-19 or climate change in general? That's a great question. Uh, so first on the civil society, let's say making up for the gaps where, where the government is not playing a role. In Brazil, in fact, because the very low social welfare services available, what has really rescued, and I mean quite literally allowed for the survival of, uh, uh, in many cities especially, have been the social movements. The, uh, for example, the favelas, the, the slum uh, areas, where, um, where there were already strong social movements present or NGOs or civil society organizations of different time, they very quickly you know, shifted their activities to basically help their, their local populations, whether it was cultural uh, associations that suddenly started becoming uh, soup kitchens or you know, their various other ways of dealing with this. And this was managed very successfully. Uh, the, uh, the other question you had was about the uh, environmental issues, uh, environmental. So interestingly, the pandemic has shown us that global challenges literally know no borders. And whereas the Brazilians in the past have been very protective of the Amazon and their own sovereignty, if you like, over the Amazon, uh, we, we can hope that the society is starting to understand that uh, uh, these challenges like uh, climate change cannot be done on their own. Having said that, you can't simply uh, uh, allow, um, or let's say you can't simply ignore issues of inclusion of the local, the indigenous populations about what their ideas are about uh, uh, developing the Amazon and such things. And these things Brazil is still far from doing. Um, I'll keep the answer short, but because uh, I know there are many more questions to come, but I could say much more. All right, great. And joining us next is uh, Danny, is Danny Koychev. He's a senior over at Suffolk University. He's an international student from Bulgaria as well. He's studying international or international relations and history. Danny, welcome. Thank you, Arjun. My question is to Professor Schmidt. Uh, so last month, Germany and France proposed a 500 billion euro, euro EU rescue fund in the form of grants rather than loans, which will be funded through a form of joint EU borrowing. Uh, something that Germany has strongly opposed in the past. My question is, what do you think caused this change of heart in Germany? And what do you think this means for the future of the European Union? Could it, for example, be uh, what some refer to as a Hamiltonian moment for Europe? Or is this overstating it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we don't know how far it's going to go, if it's going to be a Hamiltonian moment. But this is a major change from the past. In the Eurozone crisis, so we're talking 2010, with the sovereign debt crisis, um, the EU decided, and this was member state leaders led by Germany, that they were going to govern by rules and ruling by numbers. So this is in a way deciding that all you need to do is be procedurally legitimate, follow the rules, and you'll have good results. Um, and therefore, even though you didn't ask the citizens anything about this, it'll be fine. But of course, very quickly, um, the performance turned out to be pretty bad. Um, and citizens became more and more populous. Well, this meant that you ended up with kind of easing of the rules, a reinterpretation of the rules, but no serious change. And it meant that you got increasing divergence between Northern European countries uh, that did very well during the crisis, essentially, and kept growing, and Southern Europe, 
that with the um, austerity and structural reform policies simply didn't grow. And now it's Southern Europe again that's hit by a major pandemic. And it seems to me that Angela, that, that Chancellor Merkel, you know, had a moment of revelation that no, this can't go on. The, because everyone needs a single market. You know, whether you say that this is a moment where Angela becomes an angel again, as she did in the refugee crisis, or if this is enlightened self-interest, recognizing, you know, where is Germany going to export its goods? Where are Northern Europe, you know, you need, this is about interdependence. This is about the interdependent economies. And so what you saw was Germany and France got together and said, we need to move forward. We need to have a, a fund, a European recovery fund that is mainly grants. And why grants rather than loans? Because if it's loans, the countries taking the loans, i.e. Southern Europe, will build up their debt even more, at which point the markets will attack. That won't work. You give them grants, you help them grow again. And just like the Marshall Fund years ago, you know, why did Americans give the Marshall Fund, uh, fund the Marshall Fund for Europe? Not only because Europe was in a bad place and they were worried about the rise of authoritarianism, but also because where else is the market for US goods if not in Europe? Grants. And that was the way it was done then. And this is very much what was behind uh, Macron and Merkel's thinking. And what we've seen is that the European Union has come out with a 750 billion euro proposal made up of 500 million euros of grants and another 250 on top of that for loans. The only problem with this, and this is why it's also not going to be a Hamiltonian moment, is that the so-called frugal four, this is the Netherlands, Austria, Sweden, and Denmark say, wait a minute, we're worried about debt. We want those countries to solve their, you know, administrative problems, their structural issues. And, you know, we're back to the discourse of the Eurozone again and highly problematic at that. So what will come out of this? We'll see. It's going to be a temporary fund. It's not a Hamiltonian moment, but there's still euro bonds. There's going to be sharing of debt and sharing of mutual risk across countries. That's already a major step forward. And one that, you know, is, is about solidarity, is about recognizing that all of Europe is interdependent um, so in terms of legitimacy, since I have been talking about legitimacy, it's, it's about both wanting to have effective policies with good performance, but it's also about being politically responsive, recognizing that the only way you're going to stop the rise of populist anti-system parties that are going to tear the European Union down is to create some kind of solidarity. And now, thank you very much. Joining us for our last question is Nancy Shamas. She's a junior at Suffolk also, studying international relations. She's got a minor in psychology. Nancy, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Arjun. Um, my question is for Professor Schmidt. In a recent interview about the future of Europe after COVID-19, you presented three possible scenarios. One, increased integration in the EU will do more. Two, the EU will do very little and integration will not deepen. Or three, the EU will do just enough. Which scenario do you think is the most likely and what impact will that ultimately have on this crisis of legitimacy? I'm now much more positive than I was at the time. I was really afraid when I wrote that piece that the EU would only do just enough or maybe even too little, because that was clearly what happened in the Eurozone crisis. But given the initiatives that we've seen from France and Germany, and also from the European Union, we're clearly seeing a move into deeper integration. Now, how far it will go, we don't know, but clearly it will probably be enough to help pull Europe out of the crisis. 
that may dampen uh, populism for a time, so long as there's follow through, so long as there's enough that Europe is going to grow again. I mean, actually, my real fear is the US right now more so than Europe. I mean, yes, I worry about what's happening in Poland and Hungary and all of that on democracy and legitimacy issues. Um, but it's, it's the US that, you know, what's going to happen with the next election? Where, where do we go from here? This is about procedural legitimacy, accountable leaders who have policies that work, that's another big if. Well, thank you so much to all of the, teach the TAs that joined us today to ask their questions. We have a lot of great questions from the audience as well. And I know you guys are excited to hear what our wonderful panelists have to say. So let's dive right into it. Maruk, why don't we start with you? And I'm gonna combine two questions right now from Francisco and Elaine. And first, let me ask you, does the Brazilian political system provide a level of sovereignty to its states to implement their own containment policies, somewhat uh, similar to the United States system? And are citizens in Brazil satisfied with the decisions that the government officials have taken to respond to the pandemic so far? Or uh, so uh, the first question about the division of responsibilities between states and the federal government Yes, there are certain areas where state governments uh, and in fact even city governments, municipalities, uh, have a, a, a responsibility and the right to take decisions and act. However, there is one problem in this, if you like, and that is that most taxes are collected by the federal government or the large amount of taxes collected at the federal level. And then the federal government uh, uh, cascades it down to the states and then to the municipal level. And of course, if you think the power of the purse is really what matters in the way policies get run, there is of course a huge uh, amount of power that is retained in federal, uh, at the federal level, even for topics and issues that are technically in their uh, control in the remit of the, of the states. Um, also, uh, it is worth making a comment on the debt, the issue of public debt. Uh, many of the states are hugely indebted and beholden to the federal government. And so again, many of them rely on bailouts, if you like, by the federal government, and these invariably come with conditions attached, and this further strengthens the hand of the, uh, at the federal level. Uh, so I hope that answers that question. Uh, the second question, can you quickly remind me, Arjun? Yes, it is, are the Brazilian people satisfied with the decisions that the government has taken so far in response to the pandemic? I think uh, people who live in uh, towns and cities, municipalities, where their local mayors took early action and took sensible actions, worked together with the various civil society organizations, social organizations, NGOs, uh, they tend to be satisfied, but appreciate that it is the local government that delivered that. Uh, um, citizens, uh, ironically, the very citizens that were least likely to vote for Bolsonaro in the 2018 elections uh, were these citizens from the poorest uh, income groups, uh, as well as the poorest areas of the country, the Northeast. Uh, the opposition PT party won 98% of municipalities there. Uh, but now, today, these are precisely the people who are benefiting from the emergency aid program, which, as I mentioned in my talk, they give 600 reais, that's about $100 uh, a month, to the poorest uh, families. This is their only source of income and has been their only source of income for the last three or four months. And in these groups, uh, uh, in fact, Bolsonaro's popularity is going up. So I guess who's satisfied very much depends on where you're sitting. Middle class voters who voted for Bolsonaro almost en masse, if you like, wherever they were in the country, today are absolutely appalled with the handling of, uh, of the thing. Because of course, many middle class people, well-educated people, want to see the government following the science. But the government has absolutely uh, 
dismissed it as of no relevance to them. Ironically, by wanting to save the economy, come what may, even the business elites are starting to get exasperated with him. Again, a group that very solidly uh, uh, supported him. So it's a very mobile, very fluid situation right now in Brazil. I think many alliances will change as a result of the pandemic. Wonderful. So we are running a little short to the end. So we have a few minutes left and I want to be able to squeeze in a couple more questions in here. Vivian, I'll direct this question to you. This one was raised by Jen Free. For when President Trump placed his travel ban on the EU, he noticeably did it without alerting many in the nation, but also not coordinating with the European Union. First, do you think that it was wrong for him to place those travel restrictions without consulting any EU diplomats? And how is that and also his rhetoric about someone blaming the virus spread from people coming in from Europe? How is that all affecting US-European Union relations right now? Yeah, um, highly problematic, of course. Um, but President Trump also first placed a ban on China um, prior to that. And then um, also, obviously, to Europe. But what one could say is that um, in Europe itself, European member states themselves um, closed their borders without consulting anyone. So I think, you know, although I'd like to say bad Trump, I have to say bad everyone. Because um, certainly uh, Germany closed its borders, France closed its borders, Italy closed its borders one day to the next, and there was no consultation. So in some ways for Europe, this was, um, you know, a, a return to the, to, to the migration crisis when Hungary and other Central and Eastern European countries closed their borders without consultation. But what we realize is that, what one has to realize is that this is, this is where governments say, we're taking responsibility, we're closing our borders. Um, it was a problem within the EU because the European Union then said, no, this is not the way it should happen, but it did happen that way. And then it closed the external borders. So again, taking back control. What does, and I think the other part of the question is equally and more even more important, is uh, US-European relations and um, President Trump blaming Europe uh, for the virus is highly problematic. I mean, it's highly problematic with all of the kinds of terms that he's used uh, for China, calling it the Chinese virus or the Kung Fu, um, whatever. Um, these are kinds of racializing or eth ethnicalizing, no, anyway, um, the crisis in ways that are counterproductive and, you know, let's give a word to it, populist. This is about creating polarization. This is about um, trying to define an enemy so that we are all together and they are bad. And in an interdependent world, in a world without borders when it comes to viruses, it is completely counterproductive. It is highly problematic that the US, um, that the president essentially is blaming its closest ally, uh, Europe, well, and also China, of course, for a virus that, you know, travels. So what we really need is much more international cooperation. You need a WHO. Um, you need a reinforcement of the WHO as opposed to Trump saying, we're not paying for, paying for it anymore and blaming the WHO. It's again, part of a pattern. It's a populist pattern that we see, as Maruk said, in um, Brazil as well as the US in particular, but not exclusively. We see it in, in Orban's Hungary, in uh, Kaczynski's Poland. This is where um, you get leaders who essentially seek to, seek to ensure their own power by speaking to their base and trying to create a kind of polarized situation that also can go down the road to authoritarianism. Hopefully American institutions are resilient and can respond, but you know, 
It's not clear. Certainly if there were to be another term. Fantastic. So this is the end of our Q&A session from the audience. Uh, if I could ask you both, since we're short on time, to keep this answer very limited, and I know it's a big question, but I think it's a great question coming up to us from Sheridan. And that is to what extent does historical president impact diplomacy and transcontinental policymaking, particularly, and this is my own added, that we are living in quite an unprecedented time right now. So quick uh, answers from both of you if you can, and then I'll throw it over to Christina. You know, this is an unprecedented moment. So what role does precedent have? Um, if we look at the, in the case of Europe, again, um, the historical precedent for response to crisis uh, would have been doing nothing. But what you see is there was tremendous, I mean, in a way what we should talk, and this is about legitimacy, it's learning the lessons of past crises. And Europe actually seems to have learned that lesson. Uh, we have not seen it in the same way in the US from the president. However, and here we're back to institutions that Marouk did a very nice job discussing earlier, but a whole range of institutions in the US did step up to the plate and did an excellent job. Whether we start with the Federal Reserve that immediately began buying bonds, quantitative easing to ensure that, you know, that the banks would continue to work. We also saw Congress passing major legislation, um, the CARES Act, $2 trillion and more. So what you can say is institutions are still working. Um, as for diplomacy, that's another, that's another question. And here we might talk about serious problems into the future. Very quickly, I know we're running out of time. In terms of precedent uh, uh, at, at, in the level of diplomacy and um, international cooperation, Brazil has of course been uh, uh, the multilateralist par excellence. I mean, this is a state that has engaged in multilateralism throughout its history. Uh, it is a founding member of the League of Nations, founding member of the UN, founding member of almost any international organization. So the lack of precedent, uh, precedent is the outstanding thing here. That Brazil's reflex under Bolsonaro and his, uh, and, and, uh, his foreign minister is in fact inward looking, not in terms of cooperation on dealing with crisis. In terms of uh, what Vivian said, in, uh, that if you look at precedents helping you to learn lessons from what history has uh, presented, Brazil, of course, has long experience with volatile economic situation. It goes through ups and downs and massive ups and downs uh, in terms of its economic performance. And so many of the economic institutions of the state, whether it's the central bank or, or the way the treasury works, the way uh, other economic institutions work, the development bank and so on, these are very solid, uh, excellently, uh, you know, uh, 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 excellent bureaucrats, technocrats work them. And so these things are very much very well under control. For Brazil, it was very easy uh, under the uh, pandemic uh, condition to immediately kickstart and put in place countercyclical measures. So in that sense, they have learned by long bad experience with crisis. The outstanding thing, however, and really unprecedented for Brazil is that it is refusing to engage. Along with Trump, Bolsonaro also threatened that he would take uh, Brazil out of the WHO in the middle of a pandemic. Thank you very much. And thank you everybody who's joined us for allowing me to participate in the forum with all of you guys. I'll give it over to Christina now to end things. And I wanted to just say one more time, thank you. And I hope that I'll see many of you next week. Thanks, Arjun. I just have a couple of closing words. Uh, number one, thank you to all of our panelists. You did an excellent job at raising more questions than you answered, and hopefully invoking some curiosity in our audience. Second, I wanna thank our excellent TAs for asking super questions and the students who are taking the classes for inviting the public into the classroom. It was very nice of all of you. I hope everyone will join us in upcoming weeks for the next in our series, which will deal with a lot of the topics that were raised today, but not answered very well. Next week, we will talk about the role of information, 
misinformation and disinformation in how civil society responds to disparate um, responses by, by governments. And we have an excellent panel. The week after that, we have Congressman Jim McGovern, who is the chairman of the House Rules Committee joining us. And he will talk about how it is that we're supposed to remotely legislate, remotely campaign, and democracy running. So thank you all for joining us and I hope to see you next week. <laughs>